So I guess we're not ready to sing that one without the lyrics, huh? Right. Not there yet, huh? That's okay. What's up, sister? Yeah, not the, certainly not the second verse. That's okay. Whoop, we'll keep trying. Um, I just want to correct one of the announcements uh, this morning. So the Sunday evening uh, Finger Food Fellowship is next week. Not this week, it's next week. This week we're still meeting with the children's small group. So of course if you have young children, you're invited to that. It's directly after our assembly. All right. Very good. It came to pass that again Jesus began to teach. And the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he had to get into a boat and go out on the lake while all the people gathered around the, along the shore and the water's edge to hear him teach. And he taught them many things, all by parables. And his teaching, he said, listen to this. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came, and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It quickly sprang up, but just as quickly died because the soil was shallow. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up, and the thorns choked out the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Brothers and sisters, as many of you know, I, I worked, uh, I went to Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas, and I worked the entire time I was there as a youth minister in Sudan, Texas, at the Main, at the main Street Church of Christ congregation. Now, Sudan, Texas is a small farming and ranching community of about 600 people, and it's right dab in the middle on Highway 84 between Lubbock, Texas, and Clovis, New Mexico. Now the whole area, that whole area in there is huge, huge, I mean big, in cotton farming and ranching. And I had the wonderful pleasure of growing up in deep South Texas in the middle of the Rio Grande Valley which means I grew up in a town of about 120,000 people, about as far away from farmland as you could get. I was a city boy in the middle of farming country. And boy, they, they really tried to teach me about farming. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad, folks. I mean, I, I can't really understate it. Um, so my knowledge of farming and growing things, um, I know, like, intellectually, I understood that there are seasons, Right? They teach everybody that, right? Everybody gets taught their four seasons, right? Spring, summer, fall and winter, right? There's four, right? I grew up in deep South Texas. We had two seasons, summer and Christmas. That was it. That was all we had, okay? So I understood theoretically that there were seasons, but, but that's about as far as it went. Um, Brother Wayne, good old Brother Wayne, he got me into uh, leading singing and standing up in front of the congregation, doing that type of thing. And he used to ask me whenever I'd stand up to preach, now, now Cole, what season is it? And I'd have to struggle. I would especially struggle in April when we'd have a late snow because in my mind, April is smack dab in the middle of summer, right? Summer and Christmas. Christmas was long past. We're now in summer, right? <laughs> And it's snowing, which is also something I really didn't believe in until I got out of the Rio Grande Valley, because it almost never snows there. It was a tough job. They, they had a tough job trying to teach me about farming. Well, one thing I did learn about farming is that it's no joke. There's a whole lot of work, a whole lot of effort that goes into it. And you've got to be, you've got to be smart. Not just anybody can get out there and farm. Brother Cook has a PhD in it or something similar to it. But he uses it in that field. And he does a good job. Now we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, examining the good news, the good news of the coming kingdom of Christ, the coming kingdom of God. And in Mark chapter 1, we saw Christ announcing the coming of the kingdom. 
And in Mark chapter 2, we've seen him demonstrate that coming with power and authority. We've seen that actually in Mark chapter 2 and Mark chapter 3. We've seen him demonstrate the coming of the kingdom with the power and authority in his teaching, with his power and authority over our health, and with his power and authority over the enemy. And this morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter 4. We're going to be looking, taking a nice long look at that parable of the sower. And while we're doing it, I want us to consider a few questions. I'd like that we, I ask that we examine ourselves this morning and examine our responsibilities in the kingdom. And while we look at this parable and consider the words of Christ, I'd like you to think of these things. What is it that Christ is calling us to do in his kingdom? Are there people in our lives that the Spirit is desperately trying to get us to see? That the Spirit is, def- is desperately working in? And how can we as his people continue to grow and continue to mature in Christ. So if you turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Now, some of the scriptures will be on the board. I can't get all of them up there, so you'll need to be in your Bible. So I ask that you turn there now. So picking up in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then you will understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Dear brothers and sisters, do we understand that we are in a fight? That we are in a war? That our very survival is not insured? Do we understand that? We are facing a terrible enemy. A terrible enemy who has more victories under his belt, more scalps claimed, more souls ravaged than any human could ever try. Mao and his people's revolution don't hold a candle. The atrocities of Lenin and Stalin do not come close. Even Hitler in World War II has not claimed more lives than the enemy we face. He's not just ruthless. He's bold. This is an enemy who strikes at our very families, our homes, our wives, and our children on a daily basis basis and he is very bold or do you not rem- not remember brothers and sisters when he stood before the very Christ the very son of god and demanded worship we face a holy evil enemy a terrible and ruthless enemy, a cunning and bold enemy, an enemy that enslaves the world to his purposes. He's enslaved our fellow man in a kingdom of darkness. Not only does he enslave our fellow mankind, he also blinds them. Brothers and sisters, I've sat down and studied with many people. And I've watched the enemy walk into the room, sit down at people's right hand, and whisper lies into their ear. I'm telling you now, I've seen it happen. And you can always tell. You can always tell because you're looking at the Word of God. You've talked about how, how would we know how tall this thing is in front of me? How would I know this pulpit? If I wanted to know how tall this is, what would we need to do? I could ask you, Brother Adam, you work in plumbing, you work in construction, you've got a good eye for this type of thing. How tall do you think this thing is? Brother Adam's never going to sit there again. He's going to sit farther back. How tall do you think this is, brother? Four and a half feet. feet. Now I could look at this thing and say, no, brother, you're wrong. It's not four and a half feet. It's actually four and three quarters of a foot. How would we tell? We'd get the tape measure out. That's how we could tell, and we'd measure it. How about if I wanted to lose weight? If I wanted to lose weight, what would I do? Would I just maybe think, I weigh maybe about 200 pounds? 
yeah, that's right, I weigh 200 pounds, there we go. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to eat this food and maybe eat this food and, you know, I'll, I, you know I'll, just, I'll just keep track of my weight in my head. How's that going to work? Do you think I'm going to lose weight? No, that's right, son, good job. No, I won't lose weight. I got, I got one in here. I knew there was a reason we don't send you to Bible Hour anymore. Um, no, of course not. What I would do, I would step on the scale. I'd weigh myself. I'd keep track of what I ate. I'd weigh myself every day or every week or every month, keeping track of my activity and the weight. Why would I step on the scale? To see how much I weigh, because the scale's not going to lie to me, right? The tape measure isn't going to lie to me. What is the Word of God? Do you think God has abandoned us and not explained to us what He expects of His people, what He expects of His creation? No. He's left us a user manual. He's left us a book. He's left us explanation. He's left us plenty of evidence and plenty of testimony for us to understand what his expectations of us are. I'll say this in a study. The person I'm studying with will agree with me. It makes perfect sense. It makes logical sense. And so we'll talk about how we need to set aside our own prejudice. We need to set aside our own opinions and we need to come to the word of God. And you know how I know when the devil walks in the room? Because after doing all of that, after talking about all of that, we'll read something out of the book and they'll say, well, that's not what that says. What do you mean it's not what it says? What's confusing about it? Well, that's, that can't be how it is. Says who? Says you? I have seen people dig their heels in, dig their heels in, and refuse to believe the word says what it says. Our enemy is cunning, and he blinds people. But he doesn't just blind people, he blinds the church. He blinds the church. Because we'll go out there and we'll cast that seed. And he'll come in and he'll snatch it away, and we'll go home thinking we failed. That sometimes, somehow we've made the mistake. Somehow it's our fault. We spoke the word, we told him the truth, we did it in love, and they didn't listen, so it's my fault. I'm not going to go home. I'm going to go home, and I'm not going to spread the word anymore, because there must be something wrong with me. Do you hear the enemy? Have you been in that position? It's imperative, brothers and sisters, that we do not allow the enemy to discourage us. We must tirelessly continue to battle against his kingdom, his kingdom of death and oppression, and slavery. We must refuse to fall to his tricks. We must refuse to fall to arguing about lesser things, contentions and factions and human philosophies. These things are his, meant to blind the church and blind the people in the world. Instead of talking and discussing about things that will really have an impact and really set men free, we fall to talking about politics. Brothers and sisters, we can't afford to play the games the devil has set before us. We must remain focused on the coming of the kingdom of God, on the good news about the coming of the kingdom of God, about it coming in power and glory and its power to save man. We cannot afford to be distracted because it's the gospel, the gospel that will save our nation and nothing else. Others, like seed sown on rocky, soil, rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. How many of us have, how many of us have faced trial and tribulation because of our allegiance to Christ? How much money have we lost because our Lord demanded better of us? How many jobs have we sacrificed? How many opportunities have we turned down? How much ridicule have we endured because we refused, refused to step off his word? Brothers and sisters, if you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world, I don't know what to tell you besides buckle up because it certainly seems like things are about to get a lot worse. It's just the beginning. Peter reminds us, reminds the church 
in dark days such as these in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Notice what Peter doesn't say there. Peter is writing to a church that is about to be under severe persecution by Nero. And let me explain this persecution. He is going to use Christians as human torches to light his garden. That's what, about, that's what is about to happen. And does Peter look at them and say, it's time to get your guns and, and revolt? It's time. Is that what he says? He, does he say, it's time, brothers and sisters, to mount a political campaign? Is that what he says? Peter knows those things are of the world. Those things are of the enemy. The enemy wants us to do those things. He wants us to focus on other things. But look at what he says. He says, sanctify Christ. That's the first thing that you have to do, that I have to do. Sanctify Christ as Lord. Why? Because if we don't stand up when the tribulation and trial is light, what's going to happen when they come for our lives? Will we stand up for Christ? Will we stand on his word? Or will we run? Will we flee? Will we give up and allow the enemy to win? I can't answer that question for you. You have to answer that question, every single one of us. I have decided for me and my family, we will honor God no matter what. No matter what comes down the road, no matter what the government decides to do, no matter what people decide to do, we are going to sanctify Christ, period. And if that means my life, if that means my wife's lives, wife's life, she doesn't have more than one, she's got one. She's awesome, but if that means my children's lives, we're going to honor God, period. Brothers and sisters, I pray that it never gets to that point. Please don't, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not telling you this is for sure coming down the road. I'm not saying I've heard a message from God. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is, no matter what happens, I'm going to stand by Christ, period. We have to make up our mind today whom we will serve. Whatever happens... We have to trust that the Father knows best, that he knows what must be done. And our responsibility is to stand firm on his word, to continue to preach the coming of the gospel, to continue to preach the good news of the kingdom, to look at the face of the enemy. That's not our fellow man, but to look at the face of the enemy in trial and tribulation and to say, I don't care. I'm standing with Christ. Mark chapter 4, verse 18. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire, desire of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. The cares of this world. The cares of this world oftentimes seem like they're the only thing on our plate. If you've watched the news recently, it would seem like our world, our country, is on the brink. It would seem that way. And that may even be true. I don't know. Are we going to allow that to steal and rob our joy in Christ? We're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what we've been called to do in Christ. Are we going to allow the world and the things the enemy is doing in the world to rob us of that? Are we going to allow possible coming persecution to rob us of our joy in Christ? If so, why do we expect anyone to believe our message? Our message is supposed to be one that transcends these things. And if it doesn't, it does. But if we don't believe it, and if we don't live like it, why should we expect anyone to believe what we have to say? We are called to be his light. And in times of trouble and persecution, that means holding fast 
to our joy. Look at how many brothers and sisters aren't here this morning. Look around. It would be easy to get discouraged. It would be easy. And that's what the enemy hopes to do. We've got brothers and sisters who are staying home and they're staying home for good reason and they're watching us online. But the devil wants us in this room to look around at empty seats and get discouraged. He wants us to see these ropes on the pews and get upset. That's his goal in it. What's God's? That despite these things, we're going to glorify and honor him. That those who are staying at home are still taking communion, still reaching out to smaller groups, and still glorifying and honor, honoring God even at home. The cares of this world, if, we don't, if we're not careful, will allow them to choke us out. We must stay faithful in God. And in Mark chapter 4, 20, others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Brothers and sisters, if you don't understand that you have a choice here, you're not stuck being one soil or the other. This could be you. Even if right now you're struggling, the world is threatening to overcome you. Christ is there. Hebrews chapter 4 says he sits on a throne of mercy. He sits on a judgment seat, not of judgment, but of mercy to help us in our time of need. All we have to do is turn and ask. And this could be us. Christ said, you'll know them by their fruit. Spirit produces fruit in us, then we walk, and when we walk with him, that fruit grows more and more, and we go out and produce fruit in this world through him and through Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23 talks about the fruit of this spirit. And there is so much to say on this topic. It deserves a sermon all by itself. But if you are not walking by the spirit, if you are not living out his fruit in your life every day, brothers and sisters, you are missing out on the peace and the joy that Christ has in store for you. You know, we got all through that. Did you catch the most important part? It's easy to skip over it with all of this awesome stuff that Christ is talking about. It's really easy to forget the most important part. Go back up to Mark chapter 4, verse 14. The farmer sows the word. Modern conventions in farming try their hardest to cultivate not crops, but soil. Because if you've got good soil, what Jesus says comes to pass. I wonder how often we've looked at someone and decided that they weren't good soil. I wonder how often we've looked at someone and said, they're a rock, or they're shallow soil, or they're the road, so I'm going to keep this word, this gospel, to myself. Because surely they don't want to hear it. Maybe, maybe when they grow up a little bit. Maybe when they grow up a little bit and put those things off. Maybe then it'll be a good time to throw the word. Maybe then. Maybe once they get, that, get a handle on their life and fix the problems in their life, maybe then we can talk about the gospel. Maybe, maybe we look at people and think they don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about Jesus. I don't want to pray with them because, golly gosh, I'd, I'd really hate to offend them. Oh, look at him or her. Surely they aren't interested in the gospel. No, they've got too much bad in their life. They, they need to fix it, right? They don't vote like me. They don't look like me. They don't. And the devil helps us make excuse after excuse after excuse to stay silent, to refuse to throw out his word, to refuse to give people what they really need, which is the gospel 
the coming of the kingdom of God, the good news about his kingdom, the good news that there is hope, the good news that they don't have to live that way, the good news that they can be free of the enemy. We refuse to say it because they're not like us. Brothers and sisters, they will never be like us if we never speak the word of God. One day, brothers and sisters, we're all going to have to stand before God. We're all have to, we will all have to stand before him and give an accounting for why we ignored the ocean of humanity around us that was dying and going to hell every day. I don't know about you, but what I want to hear on that day is not depart from me. I never knew you. What I want to hear on that day is well done, my good and faithful slave. You have been entrusted with very little things. Now I will entrust you with much greater. So going forward, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage every single one of you here. We have the words to life itself. We have the answers to the most pressing questions that people all over this country are asking. We have the answers of the King, of the God who created every single one of us and knows how we should live. We have those answers. Please, please stay focused on the good news of the kingdom of God. Do not allow the enemy to distract you. Do not allow the enemy to distract you with lesser things. Do not allow the enemy to leave you, lead you off into the far country, forgetting, it, forgetting what you have learned from the word of God, from his lips itself. God wants all people to repent. All people, not just you and me, not just the people across the road, but every single person on this planet. He made them. He wants them because they belong to him. Please do not harden your heart this morning. If you have forgotten this, do not despair. He sits on a throne of mercy, not in judgment. He's not looking at us in judgment. He's looking at us in mercy, longing for us to come back to him. So if this is you this morning, if you have forgotten what you're supposed to be about, if you have forgotten your mission, don't despair, repent. If you have never obeyed the gospel this morning and you don't know how to obey the gospel, but you want that hope, you want that peace that Christ so richly offers, but you don't know how to get it and you're tired of trying to get it on your own, in just a second, our brother's going to come and lead us in a song. I'm going to be standing right back in that prayer room. We have elders in the back standing up. If you would like to obey the gospel this morning, I ask that you come as we stand and as we sing.